Our next speaker is Fatima Bennett-Wella. Uh, she's from University of Delaware, and she will be presenting on Unconstrained Endpoint Security System. Welcome, Fatima. Um, so good, e good evening, everyone. Um, I will be presenting on Unconstrained Endpoint Security System. Uh, before going into, before jumping into the talk, a brief, a brief introduction about me. So I, I graduated from University of Delaware in 2015 with a master's in computer engineering, and right after that I got a job in their central IT team. And I have been working with Bro for past two years, and I am a security engineer right now. And uh, I just thought that this year I might present. So this is the first time I'm presenting in BroCon this year, and last year it was my first time attending it. So I just thought that I might share some uh, stories and some use cases that University of Delaware has, and uh, some of the cool stuff or some of the stuff that I have been doing with Bro for past two years. Um, apart from my full-time job, I am a part-time PhD student as well in cybersecurity area. And let's jump into the talk. So today's uh, talk is going to about uh, what is unconstrained endpoint security system? Uh, what, ex uh, what exactly was the motivation to build one for University of Delaware? Uh, how we are going to build one? How, I, how we are doing uh, the inventory system for unconstrained, unconstrained endpoint security system? How we are using Bro for building one? And then some of the use cases and some of the usefulness we found out from, the, uh, from that inventory of software. So what is unconstrained endpoint security system? So apart from the name, uh, it is basically a system for uh, sniffing. Uh, it is basically a system to fingerprint all the unconstrained devices that connect and leave the university network. So it is really important for um, so, uh, for organizations like universities who do not control or who, who do not have a lot of control on the endpoints to know what, what exactly or what kind of software would be running on those systems because majority of the incident responding that university do is based off of the machines that we do not control. Uh, like all the clients, uh, all, all the client or all the student uh, machines that have like each student has like multiple machines uh, that they come and connect to connect to, and that they come with and connect to the university's network. So basically, that is a system we were um, thinking to build, uh, or we are in the process to build that can sniff the traffic, that can fingerprint the traffic, and then uh, then put that all information about whatever it has fingerprint for that certain. Uh, a device in an inventory system, and if we can come up with an inventory of all the unconstrained systems, because I think we know that we have we have an inventory of all the software or all, of all the um, of all the servers that we control, but we do not have much of the control on unconstrained. So we were just thinking of it would be nice to have an in, it would be nice to have an inventory of all the unconstrained systems and at least know the basic uh, software that what all clients would be running that basic software on their uh, systems. So it is a device to fingerprint the tra uh, to fingerprint the uh, to fingerprint the devices that come and connect and leave the net network and it's it, and it especially works for the uh, environments that have BYOD policy. Like if you have students coming in with their uh, own devices, that would work great. Uh, uh, for building an unconstrained inventory for that kind of system. So uh, we sniff the traffic, we, we try to fingerprint as much as we can, and then we put all the data in an inventory uh, of systems. So motivation, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, that a lot, lot of organizations, especially universities, they do not control what kind of software is installed on their endpoints. And uh, those are the systems that are highly vulnerable to all kind of attacks. So we would really like to know what kind of software would be running and what kind of versions they would be running so that if, if an incident happens in future, we should be able to take steps and we should be, we should be able to take action or we should, we should know what kind of route we have to take for that incident responding. Um, and uh, and the second point that if the basic sniffing of the, the, the basic sniffing of the traffic that you are doing if uh, if the, if, the sniff, if, if the sniffers are storing the data pertaining to those kind of devices in an inventory system it would be really good and it would it would be really useful to have that data at the time that you need that data on <coughs> solution so how we can come up with an inventory of all the unconstrained devices or if not all the unconstrained devices as much devices as are as we can that are connecting to our network. So, I know of two methods right now: um, active scanning and passive scanning. Active scanning is this, 
as the name suggests, uh, and as the majority of you guys would know that what active scanning is, uh, it is a kind of intrusive scanning where you keep scanning your network, like slash 24 or slash 16, to know what all devices are present on your network and try to guess what kind of software would be running on the system. For example, NMAP and Nessus have plugins and scripts that you can run on your, uh, on your um, slash 24 or slash, uh, slash 16 subnet to know what kind of operating system would be running. And then NMAP or Nessus will give you results that 80% sure that it is running Windows, or 70% sure that, it's, that it is running Linux, and so on and so forth. Major drawbacks of active scanning is it has to be active all the time. And it really is hard for university network. It really is, is hard to do that kind of scanning on the university network, because you do not know when the students will be coming to the network and connecting those devices to the network. So you really need to know when and where the uh, when and um, who will be connecting to the network. And besides the NMAP scans, um, if you are running heavy NMAP scans, each scan uh, runs for a couple of hours. So you cannot just continuously run the scans again and again. And uh, an another, uh, another weak point of active scanning is you may uh, potentially DOS a service that is not very uh, much resilient to the, those kind of scanning techniques. Uh, pros, uh, if you are running commercial, commercial plugins or if you are running the commercial products, like paying them and uh, running their scripts for doing some kind of uh, fingerprinting of the devices, it can be accurate, so that is one of the pros that if you are running a commercial device um, or, a, or a commercial plugin, it will be it will be accurate. And the cause I have mentioned that it it has to be active all the time. And the free versions do not have very much uh, usability. Like if you have free version of NMAP, it will give you like 50 for 50 50 percent result for some of the software that it is not sure of, and or some of the short software that it does not have scripts for. So if you are running free versions, uh, you might have very limited usability of those versions. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention that yesterday, uh, one of the products that got mentioned for uh, active scanning that people are looking is Tenium. Uh, and again, I need to mention, uh, I want to mention that Tenium is, a, as an, is an agent-based device. Like, and you cannot have it for universities' unconstrained devices because you don't even know what kind of devices would be there out, out there, right? So for, uh, for a product like Tenium for doing active scanning, you need to know your endpoints. Like, you need to know how many endpoints you have and then you, you need to um, get license for those many uh, endpoints. But the problem with students is each year students graduate, and each year new students come in. So every, every year that, uh, that unconstrained devices rotate. So you cannot have like a fixed license of, OK, I will have 30,000 licenses for Tenium, and I will have Tenium deployed on all the user uh, devices that I have. And besides, students would not be uh, uh, willing to do that, because Tenium uh, runs very intrusively. Tenium uses uh, root, root privileges and uh, do a lot of kind of intrusive work. So it, you, will, you might be getting a lot of pushback as well. So I, I just added this today because I, I wanted to just mention about Tenium as it, it got mentioned yesterday <coughs> in yesterday's talk. Um, anything? Uh, and passive scanning. OK, I didn't uh, get to the passive scanning. So passive scanning, uh, it works great for the, uh, for the network like universities because uh, you can use existing tools. So if you have, if you already have deployed Bro or Snode sensors, they work great as passive scanners because that's the only uh, important role that play on the network that they sniff the traffic all the time, like 24/7. It's just plug and play. You do not, you, you do not need to have a user intervention to run uh, passive scanning tools. Like if you have Bro cluster, it would be running all the time, 24/7. You do not need to know who and when and who, who, when and what device would be connecting to your network. If the device is going to connect to your network, it is going to generate the traffic. And if the device is communicating on the network, that traffic you can sniff through, the, uh, through your uh, passive scanners. And then you can fingerprint that device based off on the uh, traffic you uh, captured from the device. So that is one of the uh, main advantage of having passive scanning, that first of all, you do not have the, um, you do not, you, you do not have the, uh, 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 like you do not have the threat to DDoS or, or to DOS a system, and secondly, it is active all the time. One of the cons is it is not very highly highly accurate. I would like to mention that passive scanning is kind of like a sig similar to the signature-based detection. So, um, so whatever cons a signature-based detection uh, tool have kind of will linger in the passive scanning as well. So, so, so for example, if a attacker is uh, happen to uh, if the attacker changes the traffic pattern, like if attackers change, is, keep changing the user agents and the traffic pattern changes, it might trick our uh, passive scanners uh, that uh, to believe that okay, uh, to impersonate, like the the, the attacker can impersonate different operating systems running on the same device. But the goal here is not to detect attackers. The main main point of um, 
uh, the main uh, motivational point for us to build an inventory is for our students. And majority of time, students do not pretend to be attackers. Like we have normal students who run the normal devices, and we are in the normal process. Uh, we, we want to have a normal process of fingerprinting those devices. So that, that is the target, that fingerprint the normal devices, legit devices that are on, the, on your network, so that you can have um, good use, use out, out of it. And I would, I would discuss a couple of use cases in the, in the next couple of slides that how you can use your inventory and how you can use your software or how you can use the fingerprinted uh, data you have in the inventory. So why bro for unconstrained endpoint security system? Um, I have mentioned a couple of uh, advantages of passive scanning for uh, bro is bro works great for that kind of activity because bro is a network security monitor and it its sole purpose is it's not sole purpose it, but its main uh, main advantage is it sniffs uh, it sits on your network and it just sniffs your traffic all the time and the great thing is it it generates log on user friendly. Uh, uh, in, in user fr in user friendly ASCII files, so I am not I am also not a very big fan of JSON files. I also uh, tend to stick with the ASCII file because it's pretty easy to deal with ASCII files. So it, it generates a lot of uh, good uh, usable uh, user friendly logs, and we can take advantage of that. And it works great for unconstrained devices because uh, you do not need to know who and when or who what or when would, would who would be connecting to your network with what kind of devices because. The, if the if the device is connecting to the network, definitely it is going to generate the traffic. And if it if it is generating the traffic, and if you have placed the sensors in such a way that it can have the hundred percent coverage of your network traffic, then that fingerprint uh, that device is get going to be get going to get fingerprint if you have the right scripts in place. So how you how we can use Bro to build an inventory of all the software or as much software as possible for a for an unconstrained device. Um, Two main advantages of having Bro to do that. One is their strong scripting framework, and second is their strong logging framework. Uh, Bro comes with a, with some built-in scripts to do that kind of functionality, like a lot of software detection and a lot of software uh, versions and types uh, can be uh, detected by those kind of built-in scripts. You can write your own custom script. So Bro comes with a Windows version detection, and if you if you see that script, you can write your own scripts to determine other operating systems as well. Uh, and you can leverage that Bro's, Bro's scripting framework to do that. And again, I, I would like to mention that Bro has a very uh, good logging framework, so it generates a lot of different files. So as soon as you, as you, as soon as you uh, enable a script in Bro, it will start generating the logs corresponding to that script in, the, in a particular log file. So you have to just look out for the logs, and you have to just, you have to just uh, figure out the right scripts to plug, uh, right scripts to enable in Bro to get uh, those, that kind of data that you can uh, that you can create an inventory with. So talking about scripts, uh, so what scripts we can load to have to gather the inventory data. So I have I have mentioned I have mentioned the scripts that we are using currently for having the finger for having the inventory of uh, for having the inventory of um, software types and uh, other kind of versions for unc unconstrained devices. So the first script is Windows version detection. It is a built-in script that comes with Bro, and I think it is. It is by default enabled. I'm not sure, uh, but you can enable it in local.bro file. Mac version detection, iPhone detection, uh, I iPhone detection. Those are the two custom scripts that we have written to detect the iOS and macOS of different uh, devices that are connecting to the network. TLS fingerprinting. This is something uh, we came up with. Re this is something we recently came up with, and Seth helped a lot. Like all the scripts are provided by Seth, and I just tweaked them to work in our environment. What basically that script does is it's, that script determines the, uh, tries to fingerprint the TLS clients that are connecting to the um, SSL enabled uh, websites on our network to know that what kind of clients our uh, endpoints are using. And I will get back, I will get back to uh, how TLS fingerprinting works at the end of the slides just to give you an idea of um, what the file, log file looks like and how we are using it. Host profiling, it is available in the scan ng uh, package written by Ashish. Uh, host profiling gives you the uh, log file that is, uh, I, it is in the next slide, that is uh, site open ports on uh, site open port dot log file, in which you can see all the open ports for corresponding IP addresses or all the open ports for corresponding systems on your network. Software browser plugin, it's a built-in script that comes with Bro, by default enable, I believe. Known services dot Bro, I just love that script because we have a lot of use cases and we actually do a lot of things in production just on the uh, just on the basis of 
the, the log file that is generated by the known services dot, known services dot bro uh, million script, and I will come to that uh, later when I will discuss about logging. And all the others, so these are, uh, so I have not written all the, uh, all the particular scripts, but these are the software detection scripts that are, that come with software.bro uh, as a script name, and it is inside the policy slash uh, all the different protocols slash uh, folders. So policy slash SSH, SSH slash software.bro, that is a that is a that is a script that logs the ssh server information in software.log file and all the all the almost all the uh, protocols have software.bro script so these are already in uh, the the local.bro file but some of them are enabled so if you want you can you can enable the other uh, like ftp slash software software.bro file software.bro uh, script and other scripts as well we have enabled all of them because we want to know as much information as we can for, for our endpoint systems so once you determine what kind of scripts you want to uh, load in your cluster, uh, you will, and as soon as you load those scripts in your cluster, they, they will start generating the data. So they will start generating the log files, and I have, I have in this slide, I am I am talking about the uh, information, what all information we are right now getting to fingerprint the devices on the network, and these all these are the uh, some of the uh, data types we are getting from different row log files. So once you have scripts in place. Uh, you have uh, I have written this I have written the log files from where you can get that kind of data. So for the machine type, we use uh, the IEEE standards uh, public listing. It is basically the vendor detection of the vendor vendor type uh, on the basis of the three octets of the MAC address. So if you have MAC address and you want to verify that whether the iOS uh, whether the uh, whether the operating system detected by Bro is the actual operating system or not, you can easily verify with the vendors listing. So we have we are get the, uh, we are getting that vendor information from. IEEE's website and it is free, and we are getting the full version of MAC address listing, so you can you can easily get that from IEEE.org website. Operating system and version uh, again, um, majority of the data will be collected in software.log files. So what uh, what all the scripts I have mentioned in the in the last slide will generate the logs in corresponding uh, uh, for corresponding type of data in software.log files. So I have written couple of um, inform couple of data types that you can get from software.log for example operating system and version browsers in use applications and so applications and their different versions and different plugins i will go through each of them in the upcoming slides tls clients this is a custom log file which is getting generated by the custom log uh, by the custom scripts that i talked before for tls fingerprinting open ports uh, open ports and services these are the uh, log files uh, that these are the log files that get generated from uh, those uh, those scripts that I talked about, like um, for the known services known services dot bro and uh, host profiling dot bro. So these two th these two scripts generate uh, these log files: known services dot log and site ho site ho host open port dot log file. And then dangerous dangerous behavior history. If you have Intel framework enabled or if you have Notice framework framework enabled in your Bro cluster, then you can easily get that information that whether that host was involved or whether that host host was a victim of some kind of attack in the history or not. Or you can use the Snort alerts as well if you have Snort sensors uh, running in the network as well. MAC address, we use DHCP logs for the MAC address because uh, we have positioned Bro sensors. Uh, we have we have Bro sensors in a location where it cannot determine the exact MAC address of the endpoints. The, all the MAC addresses it logs is. Uh, is uh, is of uh, either switches or routers. So to get the actual uh, MAC addresses of all the endpoints that are that are connecting to our network, we directly use our DHCP logs from our DHCP servers. So these are the uh, different information that you can gather from different log files. So coming back to the first point, that how you can gather uh, the information about the operating system and version. So I uh, so this is a, a quick. Uh, I have done a cat on a software.log file, and I'm just grabbing the three operating systems right now because these are the three major operating systems we are detecting right now: uh, Mac OS, uh, Mac OS, uh, Windows OS, and iOS. So I have uh, I have highlighted a couple of operating systems that you can see that uh, window, there, there, there is a system running Windows 10, there is a system running iOS 9.4. There there are some of the, there are some systems that are running Mac operating systems of different versions. So this is just a simple. Um, this is just a simple software.log file, and you can get that kind of operating system information from software.log file. And I have included the command line as well, so if you guys are interested in running that command line, if you have the scripts enabled on your log files. Browsers in use. Um, so 
again in software.log file it has a it has a column called software type so i am wrapping right now on http browser as a software type so so i have just highlighted some of this uh, some of the different browsers that bro detects on the client machines uh, like there is an internet explorer there is a firefox running couple of versions of chrome safari and again firefox and internet explorer so couple of different other information but i have just highlighted the browser information right now because that's what we are focusing on right now in the uh, in the inventory system applications and versions uh, again if you look into the software.log file um, there is a software type called http app server if you have the scripts enabled for uh, http slash software.bro that i was talking before so uh, this software type will have all the application servers running on your system logged into the software.log file and what kind of application is running on the server i have highlighted the things that we look for like php i do not like people running p old versions of php because it is like kind of like very vulnerable service to run uh, with old versions so i have specifically highlighted four different versions of php that are running on the uh, four different machines and uh, sharepoint so some some of the uh, machines are running sharepoint and i think it's an old version of sharepoint they are running so i have highlighted some interesting stuff that we look for in software.log file and then uh, for different plugins again uh, you can look into the software.log file for and grab through uh, and grab for the http browser plugin and see what kind of uh, plugins the browsers are browsers are advertising from the client machines again i have highlighted some of the things that we look for like flash i do not like people running old flash because it's pretty uh, vulnerable software and i personally do not like flash because they are they are pretty not they are not very good in uh, pushing the updates and and they they are e easily exploitable so i have highlighted some of the old versions of flash like that person is running flash 21 of of uh, 21213 i think the latest version of flash is 26.0.0 uh, and that is a pretty old version of flash so we would whenever we would want i mean if it's a crucial machine we would and if we know that it's uh, it's a departmental machine or it, if that machine is hosting some kind of crucial data we would go ahead and we would intimate the user that you are running old version of uh, this software and you might want to upgrade to the latest version but if they are like student machine and we don't really care unless they get uh, any kind of malware on them that can actually exploit that kind of uh, old software open ports uh, so that is a really interesting file i really love this log file uh, known services.log and we do a lot of stuff with that log file so what that actually uh, what that log file logs it logs all the uh, internal not all the local ip addresses and what all services are running on your local ip addresses so i have highlighted like couple of smtp sip dtls and uh, and http uh, services that are running on different clients so small story uh, we had a recent project in which we were trying to strict strict our uh, we were we were trying to implement a strict firewall policies for some of our subnets and we would like to have them to move from default to a stricter firewall policy and for that for, and that strict firewall policy is the policy where we do not allow any internet connection to that subnet so we uh, and my and uh, and we were thinking that how we can get a list of all the uh, ip addresses on a subnet that are running some services that are open to internet so that we can exclude them from our firewall policy and then move that complete subnet to a stricter firewall policy and we were just trying to see that how we can do that and then i said that known services is the perfect perfect place to look for so if you if you do a simple command line kung fu of uh, as the as mark mentioned that using awk you can do really cool stuff with the uh, log files so if you just grab it is not in the slide so if you if you just grab through um, uh, all the i if you just uh, filter these the, the known services the doc, dot log file for that subnet you can get a complete list of all all the ip address that have some services open to the internet so we have done lot of things with uh, the known services dot log file like we uh, it is an ongoing process it's an ongoing project in which we are we keep moving the subnets from uh, default to the strict policy and we want to know what all services are running on a subnet so uh, and you can get a pretty terse list of like 20 30 ips on a subnet and you can just ex you can just verify them you can ask user that you are running https server or you are a, you are running http server that is open to internet and we would like to move that subnet to a stricter policy do you still want that service to be open and majority of time they are like no no it's it's like uh, it's like a just departmental service so you can just turn it off and we will have uh, we will have some kind of exclusions so that is a really cool thing that you can do with the known, known services dot log file another story i would like to mention that it can go other way around as well so just determining what services are running and then putting that 
complete subject behind the firewall. Uh, if you think about, so, okay, so getting back to the story. So I was going through this, uh, this known services log file with my manager, and suddenly he pointed out an IP address, and he said that, wait a minute, this IP address should not be in the list, and it was advertising the um, SSH service to the internet. And I said, why not? It, why not that? I, why not we do not have? Why not that IP address should not be on the um, known services log file? And he said that that IP address belonged to a very strict subnet that we have, and we block all the internet connections to that subnet. So, so just to give a background, so how the known services get detected by Bro is by a complete handshake. So if Bro has seen SYN, SYNAC, ACK, it would report that service as a known service in known services log file if that if that handshake ma matches the service. So basically service level detect, application layer detection. So that IP address was kept showing up on no in known services.log file and it kept showing, it kept advertising um, SSH service open to the internet. You, can, you do not see any SSH service on this, uh, this uh, file because we recently started blogging all the internet connections toward SSH servers, um, ex excluding, to, excluding our SSH servers. But anyways, coming back to the story. So he said that the IP address should not be in the list, and I said that if Bro is reporting it, that means that port is open to the internet. And then um, I verified, I verified in connection.log, and I was seeing the complete since and ACK, ACK, and I told back, I, I came back to my manager and I said that Bro is seeing the connection. That means the SYN packet is somehow getting to, the, to that IP in that subnet, even though we have stricter policy, but there is some kind of leak in the network, and somehow that SYN packet is, is managing to get to the IP address. Uh, so there was some there was some routing problem and some network guys were involved and then I started looking into more uh, detail that what all IP addresses that belong to the stricter policy show up in this log file and there were many more IP addresses that were advertising the same kind of service to the internet so um, we went to the uh, networking networking people and they said that okay there might be some kind of problem so we troubleshoot it <laughs> so so it took like almost a week or so uh, we had a lot of we, ha we had to set a lot of PCAP captures, like we, s we set up the packet capture on the system, on the server, to see what that server is seeing. We had, we had to set up the PCAP on the firewall, we had to set up the PCAP on the individual bro sensors to see if the bro is exactly seeing the SYNAC, SYN, SYNAC or ACK. So the bro logs and the, and the machine was corroborating, like bro saw SYN, SYNAC, ACK, machine saw SYN, SYNAC, ACK. SYN was missing on the Palo Alto uh, firewall, so. <laughs> So we were trying to figure out that where the SYN is not, I mean, how the SYN is leaking to the network. So our network guys figured, out, figured it out and uh, it was kind of like a mess because we do, not, uh, we do not have authority to tweak any kind of configuration on our switches or our routers or, or the routing network. So network guys were involved and we actually named that project and that turned out to be a mini project to troubleshoot the network and we, we, we named that project as the mystery of the missing SYN. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Uh, we had a lot of fun in figuring out the uh, the actual problem and actual cause of the mystery of the missing sin project. So this file is really useful if you know what to do with it. So these were the two main use cases I shared that we recently came across when I was doing the uh, unconstrained endpoint security system. TLS clients uh, again. So uh, this is a custom log file that is getting generated from the TLS scripts the custom scripts that Seth has provided that I have to, in, uh, to work in our network. And I have highlighted some of the uh, clients uh, just to give you a quick, uh, just to give you a quick look that how the file looks like. So the first column is epoch time. And I'm sorry I didn't do the bro, uh, bro cut thing to make it more human readable. Um, the second column is the clients, uh, the TLS clients who are initiating the TLS connection. The third column is the destination port. I have not included the source port, but this is the destination port on which this, this IPs are trying to connect. And the fourth and fifth column are, are the uh, TLS clients that got fingerprinted and then the uh, TLS version that they were using. So you can see W3M, I think it is a uh, text browser people still use. I was, I was amazed that people are still using W3M client to connect to a different kind of websites. Blue code proxy, MS Edge, that's, that's the mail client for Windows 10 system and couple of bash and curl uh, commands that people were using on our websites. Putting everything together, so we, we saw what kind of scripts we want to load uh, in, our, um, in our bro cluster to generate what kind of data we want to, to put in our inventory. And once you have everything together, once you have scripts in place, once you have all the data you are looking for in bro log files, 
why not to put everything together in a central repository and then make an, an inventory out of it? So aggregating uh, everything in a, in a aggregation tool, any kind of open source tool you would like to uh, use for this purpose, or, it, or if you already have a commercial tool to do that kind of purpose, that would be great. So if you, if you aggregate all kind of logs in one place, this is how our, uh, our uh, inventory looks like. I have just taken a quick screen, screenshot from the live data. So again, the, uh, the vendor column, we are getting that information from the vendor listing from IEEE. The MAC address, we are getting it from DHCP logs. Timestamp, the last time that uh, that system got fingerprinted. Known services, software type, information, uh, software information, and TLS client. And you, as you can see, majority of the majority of the information is just populated by the bro logs. So right now, I'm just working with bro logs, and I'm I'm working on how much information I can get from the bro logs and how much fingerprinting I can do. So I keep googling off. I keep Googling about the fingerprinting topic a lot, that how people are fingerprinting different kind of things. And that's how I, I got to know about TLS fingerprinting as well. I'll get back to that uh, in the later slides where I, where I explain how we are doing TLS fingerprinting. But yeah, a couple of, uh, couple of Windows, uh, Windows 10 machines, a couple of Mac machines, SSH, SSH servers are running on our network. And uh, the, the second last one is an SSH server. It's a Ubuntu Apache. It's used, it has used WGET uh, TLS client on our network to Get get to get to one of our web services and open ports. That what all ports are open. So I think 8080 is a proxy port that is open. 80 port is open. SSL port is open on that system. And again, it's an uh, uh, it's 3690. I don't know what that port is. And the port 22 is open on that on that system. So this is a kind of like look of look kind of like feel that how an inventory of the software of all kind of software that you can get for the unconstrained systems on your uh, on your network would look like. Just to get, uh, just to give you a feel, and that's our actual data. So it's not like a test data, or it's not something I'm, I'm just creating or just for this conference. This is the actual live data we get from our production client. So usefulness. So coming to the usefulness. Now we know that why we want to use Bro, how we use Bro, and now we have an inventory of all the software systems. So uh, coming to the usefulness. Uh, open SSA, so you can use it for the policy. So there are three main uh, use cases we use that software inventory for. One is the policy enforcement. Uh, you can get, you can find the old software running on your unconstrained systems by just um, looking on in your inventory. Like for example, if you want to see all all systems that are running old OpenSSH, I have just excluded the latest version of OpenSSH from the inventory, and I have got all the I have got all the servers that are running uh, the old version of OpenSSH. Like the latest version is I think 7.4, so all these systems are running a version that is not 7.4. So 6.6, 6.6, and you can see 5.3. So we have a lot of uh, requests coming from our management and networking guys that do you guys can you guys can determine how how many old open SSH servers we are running on the network because like latest vulnerabilities and exploits come every now and then so they would like to have answers to those questions that how much vulnerable we are for from uh, for that kind of exploit so we keep getting those questions so that's how we were thinking that it would be nice to have a common place where we can find all the answers like that so policy enforcement open SSH then. Open SSL. This was another project we recently worked on. So I was uh, I wanted to generate all the I wanted to generate the list of all the systems that are running old version of Open SSL, and uh, I didn't look for Open SSL, but but I looked for HTTP server in the inventory system, and I came up with all the um, systems that were running Open SSL, uh, any version of Open Open SSL, and then I came up with a list uh, of system. I gathered all the information in an Excel file, and then I came up with a list of all the all the systems that were running version that was less than 1.1.0.0f, that is, I think, the latest version of OpenSSL. And that is the actual list uh, of systems we sent out notice to to upgrade to the latest version of OpenSSL. So this is the actual data, uh, and this is the actual file. We communicate, uh, we, uh, this is the actual file of all the systems that were running old OpenSSL, and we, um, we, told, them, we told them to upgrade to the uh, latest version of OpenSSL. So, uh, Again, uh, policy enforcement, you can ask any kind of question you want. If you want to know in what kind of software is running, or if you want to know what kind of version of that software is, is running. So this slide shows the uh, all, all Windows system running on the network. We were interested in old Windows versions, but I just wanted to look for all the, uh, all the systems that were running Windows operating system. So it is just a screenshot. Those are not the only devices. We had a whole lot of another devices. It's just the first page of, uh, of what the data looks like. So it's just not like a couple of couple of devices. We had like th thousands of devices running Windows operating system. So you can, and you can see that uh, they are running HTTP browser, 
Windows operating system, Windows operating system, and what, what operating system they are running as well. And again, TLS client. Summary, so they, these are the two other use cases, and I would like to mention that uh, emulating various services and servers, so apart from finding old software, you can actually enumerate the services. Like if you want to know what all DNS servers are running on your network, what all HTTP servers are running on your network. So technically, we are in charge, Central IT is in charge of just two DNS servers. And um, recently, so another, so another short story, recently we had a D DNS DDoS attack on our systems, on our network, and um, we, were, we were getting like the alerts from NetFlow that uh, you are having ICMP flooding in your network. You have a, this 1,000 IPs are sending 10,000 ICMP packets and 100,000 IPs are, IPs are sending 100,000 ICMP messages. And I was looking at why these, these IPs from internal network are sending so many ICMP packets. So I looked into Bro and I looked into the connection logs and I, I figured out that it's the DNS DDoS attack. Like 100,000 internet IPs were sending more than 100,000 DNS packets to the complete network. And since majority of the network is, un, is our endpoint devices, they were replying back saying port unreachable, like the 53 port is not open on us. And those IP and ICMPs flooded our network and then the NetFlow was uh, yelling about you have a lot of ICMP on your network. So then we realized that why, why we can, uh, how we can prevent that happening, uh, how we can prevent that to happen in future. And then we were just thinking about that project and then we came up with an idea of why not to block DNS on the border and just allow DNS traffic to the legit DNS servers on the network. So for that project, then the another question was that how you can find out the legit DNS servers on your network. So I said, let's, let's try to um, search for that answer in Bro. So we went to the inventory, I searched for all the D DNS servers and to our amazement, there were like 24 DNS servers legitly running on the network. And out of those 24 servers, there were only two servers that are maintained by us, the IT, uh, ID system, and two are our backup servers. So, and we were looking for the owners of those remaining 22 systems, and there were professors, like there were professors in the department who were like running like four DNS servers for their project work, and I was like, can you, and we were asking them that can you migrate your DNS services to our DNS servers and so that you can, and, and then shut down your DNS server so that we can shrink that list down because we wanted to block it at the border. So they were very, uh, they were very rigid and they said no, we are not going to do that. <laughs> so we finally came up with a list of 24 DNS servers that were legit DNS servers and today only we implemented that policy on the border that we are going to just allow DNS traffic to those 24 DNS servers and we are blocking everything else in our network. And you can do the similar things for web service and, or, you, or you can do the similar thing for all the services that you know that they are legit and they are not running your complete network to actually prevent the DDoS attack like that. Because you cannot block, for the DDoS attack to prevent, you cannot block 100,000 IPs on the border and say that that will prevent the DDoS. It is not going to prevent the DDoS, right? So um, this was one of the use cases I would like to, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we actually not only have the inventory system just like that. We, we use it a lot. So we recently used it for our DNS service, uh, DNS servers blog, and then we would be potentially, we would work on the project of blocking the HTTP traffic as well on the border and just allowing the HTTP traffic to the HTTP servers. Okay, so coming back to the third uh, use case. Yeah, I have a lot of stories to share and I just realized that I don't have that much time to share those kind of stories. So, uh, a malware incident response, I had a story for that, but I would just say that uh, it would be, re so the main target for, the main target of creating that inventory was for this use case that if we know that that's, there is some system that got infected, so what all information we can get apart from just knowing the IP address from Snowtlock saying, okay, this, this IP address, source IP, destination IP, that's it. So if we know that the, what operating system was running or what kind of software was running on that system, it would really um, stir the direction of our investigation. So I have just mentioned a Petya case because we recently had a machine. Uh, it, was a dorm, it was a machine of a student who, who was in dorm and uh, one of our sensors triggered saying that that machine got infected by a Petya, Petya malware. And then we, when, we, uh, when we queried our, in, uh, our inventory system for that, uh, for that inventory system for that machine, it, it came up with a Mac OS and the vendor was Apple. So we were kind of like uh, at ease there that pet, some of the malwares are targeted, targeted toward a specific operating system. So if the person is not running that operating system, it might not be very, um, 
uh, but like ha important case for, for you at that time to handle. So we had like a release, but we did intimate the uh, user saying that you might have downloaded some kind of malware, but just make sure that you get rid of it before connecting to our network. Because if, even if that malware is not infecting that machine, that malware was so severe that if that machine will connect to the network, it will start, I think, scanning the slash 24 network, and it would start infecting the other machines if, if, it, if it would find that certain port is open on the other systems as well. So we made sure that we intimated the user, and we made sure that the user can uh, uh, get rid of the malware before connecting to it, but it was not a like uh, it was not a high priority case at that time because we knew that operating system is Mac and Macs are pretty pretty resilient to those kind of malwares, so the 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 person would not be potentially infected by the malware. So that's that's how you can do the malware incident responding with the inventory of uh, software or software system if you have it in your uh, environment. So finally, I was talking a lot about TLS clients, TLS fingerprinting, Seth giving the scripts. So this is how the TLS fingerprinting is working right now. So again, special thanks to Seth. I was Googling that how you can do different kind of fingerprintings, and then I came up with that cool project uh, that is um, in GitHub by Lee Brotherston. They have a data set for uh, all, the finger, all the TLS fingerprints uh, correspond to the TLS clients. So they have worked really hard to build up that database that if we see that kind of uh, TLS fingerprint in the network, that means this is the TLS client that is generating that kind of traffic. So um, I will quickly jump. So, uh, because I have time constraint, I will quickly jump into the how it is working. So uh, this, the, the initial handshake that happens between TLS client and server is unencrypted because that is the that is the handshake for the negotiation of what kind of cipher suite we, be, suite we will be using for encryption, what kind of uh, keys we will be using, what will be the length of the keys, and so on and so forth. And Bro has all the events to capture that kind of data. So it's very cool that Bro can capture that data, and we can implement the same uh, TLS fingerprinting project that they have on GitHub using Bro. So how we are doing it is, uh, Bro, is Bro sniffs all the connection, of course. And if it is an SSL connection, Bro is again sniffing the traffic, and it is putting in all the event files. Not event files, sorry, event, uh, event logs. and. We have the TLS fingerprint data set that is from the Lee, Brother, Lee Brotherson uh, repository that contains all the TLS clients and corresponding fingerprints. And as soon as Bro sees the similar kind of fingerprint and similar kind, similar kind of network traffic, it, it looks up the database. And if it sees the same kind of traffic, uh, then it says that, OK, this is the client that is running on the, uh, that is the TLS client that might be running on the endpoint that is trying to connect to the server using, TLS, uh, using SSL or TLS. And then it, it gets. And then the custom logs logs get generated corresponding to those kind of uh, fingerprints. Initially, we were like, uh, what it will de it will detect? It will not detect a whole, whole lot of things. But we were amazed when we plugged in the scripts and when we enabled the scripts, it detected a whole, like, whole lot of cool stuff. So that, uh, that database has a lot of fingerprints for the offensive tools. And if you use offensive tools in the default mode, not changing anything, um, these are the fingerprints of all the uh, client, all the TLS clients that were detected that keeps get keeps getting detected in our network. So this this screenshot is from the uh, report that gen that gets generated in our uh, in our uh, in our uh, environment every day, and that that reports that report gets sent out to all the security people, and then we start blocking the IP address based on the severity of the nature. So if you have TLS fingerprinting enabled, you can look for this you can look for some offensive clients like Metasploit, Burp Suite, and Skipfish, Skipfish and see if people are actually using those kind of TLS client to connect to your network. So um, yeah, I mean you can do whatever you want. I mean if, if you're detecting those kind of offensive like for example the first column is a source IP address. Excuse me. They are connecting to, to our uh, web servers on port 443 and those three IP addresses from Oregon, they are connecting on 4450 with Burp Suite. So these are the fingerprints I'm getting from the uh, from the data uh, data set, and this this is the TLS version. So it's just a pretty picture of what the log files looks like, and this is basically a report that gets sent out, and it is kind of like live data. I have not made up that data, or it's not a, some kind of test data, and we do block them on the border. <sighs> Where to find scripts? Uh, all the scripts that I have mentioned in I think first couple of slides that what all scripts you would want to have for the for the inventory data can be found on uh, this GitHub account, and the TLS fingerprint data set that uh, we use for fingerprinting can be found on uh, Lee Brotherston GitHub account, and they have I think different files like they have gzip or they have JSON. So I have just mentioned one, but you can go go to their website and see what all kind of database 
types they have. Not types, but database file types they have that you can export that data from. So yeah. I have two more slides, so bear with me. <laughs> Acknowledgements. So finally, uh, so there's a great community, awesome community out there uh, at Bro mailing list. They helped me a lot. So when I started with Bro, I had all kind of weird questions for them, and they patiently answered all the questions. And I got to a point where I have a production cluster running. We initially had only two nodes, but then we, we found so much usefulness out of Bro that we, we expanded from two to four because we, ha we only have 10 GBPS link. So we, we now have a four, uh, four production clients that are workers and one manager. And I kind of like manage the f uh, five um, node cluster. And I do mo majority of bro stuff that, uh, that in our team do, uh, majority of bro stuff in our two, uh, I am the one who is in our team that do the majority of bro stuff on the bro cluster. And whenever I have some kind of uh, imbalance or whenever I have some kind of questions about Bro and why it is not working, why it is working weird way. I just put up questions in Bro mailing list and I get a lot of answers pretty quickly. So I would like to thank them, thank them for their support throughout the year and hopefully will continue in the future. And uh, I would like to thank the Bro team, Bro community for giving me a chance to present uh, in this BroCon talk. Is this, in this BroCon uh, talk and uh, thanks for enjoying my talk if you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Be nice to me. This is my first time. Please be nice to me. <laughs> great, great first time talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, could you please discuss your methodology for uh, weeding out false positives and what you did to see if your scripts were vulnerable or would uh, emit false positives? Oh, we get a lot of false positives, but we try to uh, improve on scripts. So, we like, so that's why we do not have a lot of uh, operating system scripts so far. Uh, we so for the Windows operating system, it's pretty accurate. But for Mac and uh, iPhone detection, we still get some of the false positive. But it is pretty accurate. Because if the clients are not tricking you in some kind of tricks, like if the clients are, as I mentioned before, that if the clients are legit and, the, and they are generating legit traffic, you can fingerprint them pretty easy. And you can fingerprint them with high true positive ratio, unless they are doing some kind of weird stuff. So we do have a lot of instances where multiple operating systems get detected for a single MAC address. It might be either they're running multiple VMs on that machine, or it might be that there is, this is some kind of a NAT machine or a router machine. And we have a lot of kind of use cases like that, that multiple operating systems get detected for just a single MAC address. And then we, when we dig through it, we realize that, oh, it's a Cisco router, or it's a NAT, or it's, a, it's some kind of switch. So we do get false positive, but it's not very high. And for the, for the, for the um, inventory data, we are just looking for some legit users that are not, uh, tampering much with the traffic. So that's why I have uh, some more, um, we, will, we will have some more features to kind of like reduce false positive. That's why I wanted to include the vendor Mac, uh, vendor listing for Mac address to verify that if vendor is saying it's an Apple Mac, then uh, what our uh, fingerprinting, uh, what our um, fingerprinting device is saying, if it is saying it's a Windows operating system, there's a mismatch. So either that person is spoofing Mac address or that person is running a VM that is loaded with the Mac operating system. So there, is, there has to be some reason that why there is a mismatch between two data sources reporting, reporting for the same MAC address. And the, from there, you can go investigating. And if you, if you, if you can, you can either whitelist or uh, you can either whitelist or you can uh, work, on, work more on your scripts to make it more uh, resilient to false positives. But we do not get a lot of false, false positives so far for the, for the inventory system. If that answers your question. Go back two slides to the ones with the URLs. Oh, that was an easy question. So good that you're in the community, Fatima. Thanks for that talk. Um, First of all, I'm shocked that you discovered that professors that run their own DNS servers are rigid in any way. I'm surprised that you discovered that they're rigid. Um, <laughs> they're not even they're not even up for the negotiation. Okay, <laughs> right. We can host the services for you. Just migrate your DNS to our. It's because you framed it as a conversation that in which negotiation was possible. That's the problem. <laughs> but. <laughs> 
I've spent a long time in this environment. I wanted to ask a different question. So you framed the project, the motivation, as one creating an inventory for students, um, you know, because so many of them leave and come, and they're non-compliant about in installing host agents. But a lot of the benefits you describe go way beyond that. And I'm wondering if your team has come to think of this resource a little differently. Um, just the, the open SSH server is one example, but I can imagine many others where this database of known services becomes generally useful. So are you using the tool differently uh, within the team? Yeah, yeah. So we, so these are the use cases we came up with. So when I was thinking about that idea, that was kind of like an academic idea. So we were like, I, I was, I was, um, I was taking a machine learning course, and we we wanted to build a project for that class, and we were just trying to figure out how we can mine data, how we can come up with a with a with a project like that, and and then we came up with an idea that why not we can just create an inventory like that, and then I started thinking about. And that's the advantage of having a full-time job in university because you have all the live data that you can uh, fiddle with. So, and, and then I started working on that. And the first time I presented that idea in my team, they were like, there is not a lot of use for that idea. I mean, we don't know. We have log files. You can just go and look into the software.log or whatever. Like, uh, so whatever information we have, we have collected so far, they were not, not very up. They were not really very up with that kind of idea. So I got like a lot of support from the academia side, that motivation that, okay, it would be good to have inventory. Because we do, not, we, do, we do not do a very great job of having an inventory for our own systems. We still lack some of the systems that are new, and we have not yet inventory, inventoried them in our inventory. So I was, just, I was just thinking that we do not even have our inventory for our IT um, system. So that is a really big hole, like when you do not know what kind of software is running on the devices that you control. So it will be way beyond to know what all kind of software would be running on the systems which you do not control. So um, and and then yeah, you 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 were right that there are a lot of use cases that go beyond with what I currently what we currently have. But these were the three basic use cases we started working on. So uh, and I started working on basically because they were just they were just asking questions. Do you know how many DNS servers we are running? Do you know if we can implement that policy? And I was like, yeah, just give me two, two seconds, and you can just quickly query that data, and you can just get a terse list, and that list is highly accurate. We have not gotten any a report from the department saying that you accidentally block our DNS server, and you should have intimated us before. Knock on wood, we have not gotten any. So the list we got from the, that inventory that there were 24 DNS servers on your, on, your, uh, on your network, it was a pretty neat list. Like we verified with the users, we contacted them, we tried to negotiate with them that if we can reduce that list a little bit, but nobody was willing to do that. So we do not get a lot of false positive on, uh, on, on that side, like if you want to know all the services. Because if it is a legit service, it has to generate normal traffic. So if it is a DNS server somewhere sitting in the network, it has to, it has to have traffic hitting on port 53. Otherwise, there is, not, there is no use to have a DNS service if it is not serving that service to the internet, right? So um, we get pretty neat results from the inventory. Like the second use case I mentioned, that you can enumerate the, user, you can enumerate the servers. That is a pretty neat use case. Like we, we get the request all the time from the upper management saying, can you determine how many HTTP servers we are running? Oh, I think it's 500, all right. And people come up with the numbers. Like I think it's 500 or so because each department have their own websites, have their own servers, ser servers and services running. So it's a pretty neat place to look and to dip for a pretty quick answer that, okay, roughly I think inventory is reporting that it's 500. So I, we would assume that plus or minus it would be around 500 or so. We might have missed on some data, but it, we can get a rough number at least to begin with. So that's how we are using right now, but you're right, it can go beyond yeah. that. Okay. If, I, if I got the question correctly. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Chris. Uh, so when, uh, back on the false positives, you're using the uh, vendor list and the MAC addresses to help reduce the false positives, and you scan web applications and stuff looking for things. Have you uh, looked at things like Blind Elephant to help do the fingerprinting, or are you trying to do that yourself based on strings that you get? Blind Elephant's the open source part that Koalas uses to do fingerprinting for web applications. Oh, I didn't know that. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, I would definitely, no, we do the fingerprinting not using the blind elephant, if that's what you said. Okay, yeah, uh, blind elephant, it's a Qualys open source, it's the open source component that they use to fingerprint web applications. So if you're not, if you're rolling your own, you might want to look at that and might save you some time and get uh, more accurate fingerprinting. 
So I would definitely, thanks for the tip, I would definitely look into the blind elephant and see what they are doing for web application fingerprinting. Okay.